Welcome to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to this afternoon edition of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime and once again another incredible panel and on this uh panel uh sadly sits one of the victims of a horrific crime uh that happened on the ma and pa trail in maryland uh back at the very very beginning of august um he has one daughter named Faye, and Faye's mother uh is rachel morin and that of course is matt mcmahon who i'll have more formally introduce you to in a moment but uh just before going uh on air matt sent me a quick note and it is a little chilling to read this but matt's note said 107 p.m today so just in about 30 minutes i uh, 35 minutes exactly exactly 35 minutes marks seven months since the 911 call that alerted the harford county sheriff's office that Rachel's body was located on the Ma and Pa Trail. So a somber day in that sense. It is a seven-month anniversary. Hard to believe that that much time has uh, gone by that we have been covering uh, this case. Um, the Harford County Sheriff's Office says that Rachel Morin's death was the result of a quote-unquote violent homicide. And uh, even though there are not a ton of new developments, al although we will hear from Matt about the latest, um, we've got to keep doing shows. We've got to keep getting the word out there. Um, Rachel's killer has got to be found. Um, as I mentioned, Matt McMahon is uh, top right of your screen. Always a very thoughtful uh, guest. He's been on before and uh, prayers, obviously, to him and his family. And uh, let's hope that they catch uh, Rachel's killer. Faye is his only daughter and is Rachel's oldest child. She was uh, in an episode via... Uh, a little video that was shot from Tim Papa, former FBI agent. And if you didn't see that episode, um, Tim Papa, with his experience at the FBI, is trying to shoot um, emotional videos to jar people's memory or jar people into, uh, you know, working to try to help find where this killer is. So Tim Papa doing great work there. Everyone knows uh, F Agent Scott Duffy. Uh, he is now the director of Wilmington University's Criminal Justice Institute. He is rocking wearing a Boston sweatshirt from a Philadelphia guy. Is that legal? You're going you're gonna to get beat up on the streets. It's a good thing you're an FBI agent. Um, Scott is a retired supervisory uh, agent at the De uh, Wilmington, Delaware office. He did it all. Uh, gangs, bank robberies, fugitive task force, the list goes on. He also was a police officer for five and a half years before that. And last but not least, um, I specifically told Matt I was going to ask Phil Ramos to come on. Uh, that is because he's a three-time Officer of the Year in Las Vegas, 35 years of service, 15 years in homicide, uh, arguably you know, one of the toughest departments uh, to work in because they've got a ton of crime uh, in Las Vegas, and uh, he is a great guy and a great investigative mind, and so maybe he will have some ideas uh, to share uh, with Matt. So, uh, Matt. To you first, obviously, what about this um, inauspicious anniversary today that uh, 107 marks seven months? Is it hard for you to wrap your head around the fact that it's been that period of time and still no answer as to where or who this killer is? Um, well, that's a tough question just because I, I never really paid much attention to true crime. I, I Before this happened, I really didn't have any sense of how things would be expected to go. Uh, I would have hoped, obviously, that we would have caught this suspect uh, so much sooner. Um, I'm just hoping we catch him soon. Um, my sense of time seems to be a little bit warped uh, because of everything that's happening. I Every single day, I, I pretty much think about the case every day, most of the time. Um, my days tend to blend together just because you know, I have the same thoughts every single day thinking about you know, who this guy could be, trying to think about different questions I might be able to ask the Harford County Sheriff's Office that could maybe push things forward. Um, I don't know. 
seven months is, is kind of difficult. I, I keep thinking about the one year anniversary coming up and I'm just hoping for the kids that that doesn't roll around and the suspects still out there and we're not any closer. I do know that the sheriff's office is making progress. It, it's slow, but they're making progress. And, and Matt, uh, I know how difficult this is for you, but how is um, Faye, your only daughter, Rachel's oldest child doing and how are the other children doing? Um, Faye's doing, uh, I guess she's doing okay. Um, it was about the three month mark, uh, when she started coming out of her shelf prior to that, she had pretty much been, um, keeping herself, uh, at home almost every day, all day, uh, spending a lot of time in her bedroom But that on the actual three month mark is, is when she went out for a walk on another trail with her boyfriend and, and that marked the beginning of her starting to to come out of her shell a little bit more and, and exposing herself to the world a little bit more. And most recently she's uh, decided to start um, getting into fitness as a way to connect with her, her mother. Uh, she used to run with Rachel uh, on the trail and, you know, on Thanksgivings, uh, she would uh, participate in Bel Air's uh, uh, annual Turkey trot. It was just a, you know, Thanksgiving day, a uh, small run. I think it was 5k or something like that. She's participate with Rachel. Um, but now she's getting into to lifting weights uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, she's running in an extremely safe manner. Uh, so nobody needs to, to worry about that. And, uh, you know, just the other day I saw her looking through a couple of Rachel's dumbbells, uh, lifting them up and seeing which one fit her and she's using them in her workout routine. Uh, so I feel like that's, uh, a really good sign that, uh, she's not locked away in her bedroom anymore. Um, the other kids, they're struggling a little bit, um, but they're also making progress. Two of them have had uh, birthdays already. Um, the the seven year old turned eight in uh, December, and the eleven year old turned twelve in December. And then the thirteen year old, uh, she has her birthday coming up in April. So there's a lot of important events that the kids have been having to deal with without their father. Well, excuse me, their mother. Um, yeah. But yeah, all three of us fathers have been trying to to stick together to, you know, they say it takes a village to, to raise a child. So we're trying to make, make a little tiny village as best we can to keep the kids together. Um, they talk a lot on the phone uh, every day. They play games uh, on their phones. So even when they're not around, they're connecting and they're doing things together. They text each other a lot. Um, so they're doing their best they can. But ultimately, they want to catch the guy. And what's the age range of the kids? What's the youngest is how old? Uh, well, they're uh, 8, 10, 12, 13, and 18 now. Wow. Wow. Um, please send them our uh, regards from the show. Please let them know that we're thinking of them. Um, I'm going to throw this question right back to you, Matt, and then we'll uh, get Scott and, and Phil to weigh in. But um, Kaz loves cakes. Uh, she's in Scotland and wants to know if there's anything that international viewers can do. I always say, and I'll continue to say it, best guess, better community. We've got the best community that will go above and beyond uh, to do what they can. What would you like? Um, what would you like people internationally to do? Can they email? What can they do? Um, engage. Uh, people on the internet, uh, share shows like this, uh, get the word out ab about the suspect. Uh, there's a couple of really good sketches out there. So there's some really good um, information about who this suspect is. You can share that. There's there's different groups. You can share it around that maybe different contacts you have, particularly in LA. I feel like LA is one area where we need to get the word out uh, a little bit more because I personally believe uh, this man had his roots in LA, then came to, uh, Bel Air. So I feel like the more we can get attention over to LA, the closer we'll get to finding the suspect. Um, mm -hmm. just keeping the word going, uh, out there and not letting Rachel be forgotten. I, that's what anybody in chat can do. Uh, you're hearing it straight from, uh, the father of Rachel Morin's oldest child, Kimber Miller here. Uh, this did not occur to me, but again, why we have the best community. Can we take a moment of silence at 107 for Rachel? I just set my alarm. We've never done that before, but uh, let's do it today. Uh, I've got Leisha Gallegos um, in Colorado. Um, Scott Duffy, someone earlier in the chat said, where the heck is this guy? Scott Duffy, um, you've always been confident that they're going to catch this person. Um, 
how is that going to get accomplished, Scott Duffy? What are the next steps uh, from this point? And how do you not get discouraged after seven months? Yeah, a couple of different uh, questions. So the not to be discouraged is very tough to say to Matt and Rachel's loved ones. You can't, you, it, it, it's just the continued beating the drum of positivity and saying, the good thing is, look at what we do have. We have DNA now in two of the crimes. DNA, he can't shake. He can change his face. He can change this. He can change that. He can change his hairstyle. He cannot change his DNA. So that's 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 a good thing, and it will catch up to him. So so with regards to um, some of the next steps, uh, you know, I I. I would venture to say, and and Matt would be in the same, that law enforcement is on top of this. And and as I'm sure we'll talk later, um, as Matt will reveal some additional uh, information, in other words, like when, when the sketch got released and so forth, additional tips are coming in. And uh, all that is good. Everything you're doing, Joel, and every, every media exploit of keeping this alive is a good thing. And um, we can say, so for example, when we share texts and whatnot, a similar described murder across the United States with perhaps a, a similar uh, description of the male that um, we hope that, do they have him, do they have him, the one who did uh, Rachel's murder. And then, and then of course I say, Hey, they have his DNA. So they'll know quickly, um, and, and exclude him or include him. So yet when another murder takes place and, and then of course they realize he's not the one, those are good things because law enforcement is able to move away and keep focused on finding this terrible killer. He will be, he will be caught. And, um, and if law enforcement does come up with a name to that DNA hit, that DNA uh, um, genealogical investigation, um, then they'll go full speed in locating him and getting him off the streets. So it's 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 difficult, but it is. I am. I I, I never say a hundred percent, but I'm a hundred percent in this. It's just not a timely fashion. It's not a and seven months is way too long, but it still is the reality of of how these cases can uh, can move on. They do have DNA, and so they're moving forward. It's just slow. Hmm. Uh, Gen X Granny is one of our amazing mods. Uh, someone else in the chat just said, hey, I live in northern Canada. There's nothing I can really do. But what you can do is what Gen X Granny is saying. Uh, we're going to get the sketch back up. The COE just took him down for some reason, but we'll get him up in a second. But there's new sketches, and uh, you never know where he is. For all you know, he's in northern Canada. You just don't know. So um, the best thing everyone can do is get on social media and spread the word and keep the word going. And, uh, you know, we had a juror number 18 from the Lori Vallow Daybell trial yesterday, and I was asking him since he, you know, sat there through um testimony for all those weeks if it now gives him pause when he sees you know these headlines in the newspaper about a murder or violence and he says it does well this is the flip side of that you're seeing the victim's family and it's seven months this is rachel on the left and uh the sketch uh, and you see uh the reward money is now thirty five thousand um, dollars and if you have tips it's rm tips at harfordsheriff.org rm tips at harford h-a-r-f-o-r-d sheriff.org for those who are listening and not watching uh this is um a bigger shot of the sketches uh detective phil ramos uh you spent 15 years in homicide i know you had to have cases where you were seven months out uh what are you doing at the seven month mark and how are you not getting dejected as an investigator uh, you just got to keep pushing. Um, <clears throat> this is one that uh, they'll start taking personals now because because you're so close having that DNA profile, but you're miles away from who that profile belongs to. So 
the frustration sets in saying, we know who this guy is. We just don't have a name to put on him. And, you know, a lot of the viewers are absolutely right. He could be anywhere. It could be Mexico, Canada. Uh, we don't know what his resources were. And so it's possible that, that he's not in the U.S. anymore, but it's just as possible as he's laying low uh, and, and not going out in public. Because if you know who this guy is and you see that video from California, you're going to be able to identify him. You're going to say, hey, that's so-and-so. I, I know it's just a matter of getting the right people to see that video and then getting those people to do the right thing and call the cops and say, I know who that guy is. Um, it's such a huge advantage right now with the profile. And I can't imagine that they're not working on uh, a genetic genealogy profile to try and track this guy down. Those can take so much time. You know, it, it's not done in, in 60 minutes with commercials. It takes a long time to develop that genetic profile. And, and I'm without knowing any more than, than we know about the case publicly. I'm absolutely certain that's what they're working on, but it, that takes a long time. Hmm. Uh, back to uh, Scott, and then we'll go to Matt about some of the latest developments. But uh, does Scott and Phil really believe this crime will be solved from Harford County? I mean, Scott just went uh, on the record saying they're 100 percent going to catch this guy. But uh, Scott, do they need the resources from old agency, which I think they've got some. But um does it have to, does the network of law enforcement have to expand beyond um, Harford County Sheriff's? Obviously, L.A. is involved, but do the feds need to get heavily involved to, to root this guy out? It's not so much that the feds need to get involved uh, to find this guy. It's, it's, but the going back to your earlier point, the network is absolutely key, uh, federal, state, and local. And, uh, and those networks um, are just getting better and better um, each and every day. I really do believe that, not only in my own time uh, in law enforcement, but each and every investigator develops and just continues to build this amazing list of detectives that you have met throughout your career professionally and personally. And, and so as, as Harford County continues to build... Um, that network of experts that they may not have had uh, the day before Rachel's murder. Now they have a whole another set of, of experts and eyes um, and they have to, and, and the pressure on the fam of the family on them is to keep that list growing and, and including those who have um, something to offer to be, to, to have a seat at the table. But I can say to that question, it's a hundred percent. It will be solved. It's it's just not going to be in the timing that 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 we want. But you already have the DNA, and you have the DNA profile, and you already have a connection between the East Coast and the West Coast. So in that regards, it 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 um, they have somebody. They have something that this person cannot shake. And just to give it, it doesn't help time wise. But Philadelphia, just in the last couple of months, um, they had a series of, of, of rapes and a homicide as a result of a sexual assault 20 years ago. It's a long time. But genealogy and and wasn't around then or just starting to come on onto the scene. So um, so there were things being done by law enforcement to refresh that. But what happened? This guy didn't go far. A guy comes out of the woods on a trail and uh, starts starts waving a machete and law enforcement is able to get in there and nab him. And um, and what did he not shake? He didn't shake his DNA. And they had DNA profile from 20 years ago and they matched the uh, the assaults from just a couple of months ago to homicide and sexual assaults of 20 years ago. So um, it, it will be solved. Uh, ruthless coming to us from uh, the UK. Uh, back to Phil, and I promise we're getting back back to Matt. But we've got time, and uh, we've got three gr three great guys on. Uh, Phil Ramos, the LA connection is key. Do you think there's footage footage of him out there that we haven't seen uh, from other residents? Blackwood or saying Scott Duffy Wisdom. This is the um, footage that the WJZ newsroom LA, tonight. But, the Harford yep. County Sheriff's Office giving an update.
there's the audio i'm gonna get rid of there but uh phil ramos this is a video of the um alleged suspect uh phil ramos what if you're working this case and you're on the hartford side what do you have to do with the la side to work um in concert with them i'd go to la i'd grab a partner go to la and go through everything that they have there um you know lapd is a good department they're they're outstanding um but they're probably not taking it as personal as the guys that are investigating this case so um and they very well have may have already gone there. As far as other video, let's hope that there is, and let's hope that the people who have it have turned it over to the cops so that they can try and track his movements. Um, is as common as home surveillance systems are now, you would expect that to be the case. And certainly, a guy walking down the street at this time of night without a shirt on is going to draw people's attention. But you never know. You never know how that pans out um i would say that there is video available hopefully the cops have seen it and it's got enough of a clue in there that that's part of the holdback that they're that they're keeping close to the vest because you know as we all know we, we just can't let everything out there in public scare this guy off and, and let him know where we're at with an investigation so that may be that may have already happened um and why that's not being released is is anybody's guess, but it's there will be a very good reason for that. So, um, in in my view, that there should be existing video, more existing video, and it it hopefully it has been examined by the cops. But um, you know, like I said, it, I I would have I would if I was the administrators for the uh, actual agency that's uh, the lead on this. I'd have them in LA quite often going over everything personally themselves and not depending on another jurisdiction or another agency to take the interest that your guys have in this case, because they're the lead investigators on it. Mm. Uh, that's a great question. But to Matt first, um, Matt, any, um, any new information that you're able to share? Uh, I know you're getting periodic updates. Um, the last thing that we had is that we heard from, uh, Sheriff Jeff Gaylor on his own podcast, which I'm going to ask Scott and uh, Phil about. But any any new information? Uh, well, first, let me go back to to the whole camera thing. Um, they, they did canvas the uh, the L.A. neighborhood uh, looking for additional footage. Uh, they did check all the different homes uh, with cameras. Unfortunately, they didn't find anything. And I think it might have to do with uh, the range uh, that a lot of these cameras go out. So uh, unfortunately... There doesn't seem to be any additional video of the suspect other than that that camera. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why they're having such a difficulty finding this guy is because there's so little information to show who this guy is uh, other than that that one little video segment and these these two sketches. Um, so um, talking about updates, let's go back to December because I think that's that's when I first heard about the development of these sketches. Um, and I've heard a lot of comments saying, why did it take so long for these sketches to come out? Uh, because they came out, I believe it was around the six month mark. Um, and they were spending a lot of time talking with different witnesses to get information about the suspect to work on the sketch, then having witnesses validate the sketch and then tweak the sketch based upon the feedback that they were getting. So they were being very careful to make sure that they had the best possible sketch instead of rushing something out. So they were working on it well before December and then they had hoped to be able to show Faye uh, a copy of that sketch sometime in December, but they needed to, to, to stretch it out just because the development process was taking longer because of tweaks. Um, so they were very careful and cautious with this sketch, which I'm grateful for because I'd much rather have a good sketch go out instead of a, a quick bad sketch that might point people in the wrong direction from this suspect. Um, so anyway, uh, the sketch, I believe, was released around February 12th or so, uh, the same day that they had that podcast. Um, that was the we learned uh, that morning that they had released the sketch. So it, it kind of caught us a little bit off guard. We were thinking it was going to be released a little bit later. Um, 
I think it was about 20 within the first 24 hours, they had received uh, about 100 uh, new tips uh, in response to the sketch uh, and the podcast uh, information. I was being told uh, they were much at that point, I was told the tips were much higher quality uh, than before, uh, which makes sense because this is some good information. Um, and then I think it was about uh, February 23rd, I was told that they were up to about 500 new tips uh, following uh, the release of the sketch. And it was at that point, it was a mixed bag between um, mediocre tips and good tips. Um, and then yesterday, uh, the update was that they're receiving about 15 tips a day uh, at this point, which is good. Um, some of them are from uh, internet sleuths, which have a, a varying degree uh, of quality to them, uh, just because some some of the internet sleuths are just going from Facebook profile to Facebook profile and just sending in tips based on anybody that they think looks like the guy. Um, I do know that based upon the tips that they've received, they it has opened up different avenues of uh, investigation for them to to potentially bring in new data. Um, I think that's probably about as specific as I would want to say with that. Um, with, with, with these sketches, and forgive me because I'm taking some notes as you're speaking. Mm -hmm. I hope I didn't miss it. But do you know how exactly how they were generated? Was it off of the... Is that what you're saying? Was it off of the video? Witness testimony. It was a combination of witness testimony and um, the video uh, themselves, uh, mm -hmm. itself. Uh, so it is a combination of that. Uh, I was uh, on another show that involved the sketch artist, and uh, uh, he spoke very specifically about how it's important not to mention the specific witnesses that were used to generate the sketch. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, multiple witnesses were used to generate and validate the sketch. Um, the hat uh, that's in there, that is uh, the hat that was left behind from the L.A. Uh, crime scene. Uh, when the suspect was discovered in the house, there was an altercation. I'm assuming that the hat was knocked from his head during the altercation where he was being forced out of the house. Um, and they were able to get DNA from the hat, uh, which is fantastic. Mm. Wow. Um, Phil Ramos, Detective Ramos, when you look at these sketches, um, I'm curious what what you're seeing when you look at them. And just hearing the way that they were generated partially by the video and partially from witness testimony, do you think these are, with your experience, pretty spot on? you think when they get the suspect, he's going to look quite similar to this? Well, it depends if he's changed his appearance or not. But um, many times sketches will resemble the suspect. And it turns out that when you find them, you... A lot of people say, oh, well, his nose didn't look like the sketch or his ears were different. And, and that could be, you know, that that that's based on. I mean, I mean, you can only get so accurate on a sketch. Um, and that's why you can't use the sketches to generate uh, facial recognition software to try and match that, because you have to have the actual features of the face. And, and I don't want to get into that, reveal what features are involved in facial recognition software. but you couldn't use the images from the sketch to establish facial, rec facial recognition software profiles. So I think that they will look similar to that. Um, there's always going to be slight little differences, but uh, depending on how good of a look the witnesses got that were, and they were able to articulate to the artist. And then once that, once those, uh, sketches are generated and they look at it and they they can look at it and say oh no his eyes weren't quite that wide or you know make tweak it just a little bit and those are the things that will will make a difference on how close the sketch looks to when they finally have this guy in custody and you know he he could now have a full beard he could have a full head of hair it, it's hard to say and those types of changes that a person's going to make and he very likely has um, will really make a difference on how he looks at the time he's apprehended versus the sketch. And, and Phil, um, in your experience, a guy who commits this violent, this heinous a crime, what are the chances that he didn't do something prior to the murder of Rachel or since the murder of Rachel? I mean, is it, it I assume there's a psychological component where these guys can't control themselves. So 
Is it just a matter of time before he lashes out again? Yeah, he probably already has lashed out again. Um, but we don't, you know, we don't know that. Uh, the good thing about the DNA profile is any time a crime that's similar to this, if there's sufficient DNA to get entered in the CODIS, then they're going to bang, get another hit, another uh, scene hit from a different jurisdiction, possibly, or maybe even within the same area uh, where both of these crimes are committed. So, you know, you're dealing with the most unpredictable thing in the universe, and that's the human mind. And there's no way of knowing what this guy's thinking or, or what his reactions to see in his face splattered all over TV nationwide, what those reactions are going to be. So, you know, one would expect that he goes into hiding. One would expect that he's not going to be out in public so that people recognize him based on these sketches. But, you know, you, you never know. And, you know, that doesn't uh, exclude the possibility that he could be in custody somewhere. And wherever he's at in that jurisdiction, they didn't take his DNA and, and put it into CODIS because of parameters on different jurisdictions. You know, m many jurisdictions, you don't get a DNA profile on everybody that comes into your jail. You get a DNA profile based on what the protocols for that specific jurisdiction are. Mm. I mean, that's sort of, in an odd way, best case is that he's locked up behind bars so he can't do anything, but the fact that they yeah. wouldn't know and maybe let him out is not good. Um, from Kelly P., um, so there was a big story in the news a couple of weeks ago, and I want to get Matt's take on this, but first to Scott, uh, Lakin Riley was attacked on the University of Georgia campus, even though she was not a student there. Um, and the, the MO, you know, just while she was running broad daylight, uh, seemed very similar. And then they put, um, a photo of the suspect out and there were some similarities. So right away I reached out to Scott Duffy and Scott said, Ooh, you know, let's look at this. Um, but here there's another case now, uh, Emily Bradley, I, she was murdered, um, at a Creek. Her body was found in a Creek, I believe in Nashville, Scott Duffy, uh, with these other cases popping up around the country, I assume Harford County, and maybe it's a wrong assumption, but I assume Harford County has to know about this murder in Nashville and has to be checking to see, you know, if there's similarities, uh, differences, uh, the modus operandi, the way uh, the, the woman was murdered here versus Rachel. Do they do that? Are they cross-referencing, or is it just is it just too big a country with too many agencies? Uh, the, um, so it's not too big of a country with too many agencies. It is a matter of this network that we talked about, um, and and this is where also tips are good and shows are good to keep the name, and then of course, for example, learning of another crime in another jurisdiction. So. Just to, and, and I think on a previous question that was in the chat, um, law enforcement does not have to do, or let me be specific, Harford County does not have to constantly go in and check the system. Did I miss something? It's not like an inbox that hasn't been read yet. The system is doing its job every time a law enforcement agency puts in a DNA that is a uh, quality, follows all the protocols for um, CODIS, it's entered, it's accepted, and, um, and it knows automatically how to check itself. So that system is doing the job. So nobody has to be, oh, I forgot last week to go and check, which is a good thing, just like fingerprints. There could be a fingerprint, an unknown, latent print submitted by an agency. And once it's submitted into APHIS or IAFIS, the system is doing its job checking, cross-referencing, and saying match, no match. And then if there is a match, the system is going to send that to the, to, to the agency in charge of the investigation and say, now you go and do further investigation. For example, it'd be like, your guy is there. Now go roll, go, go get a set of prints and do a hard to hard uh, match. So there's all these systems in place for that. Um, so it's not like there's a unchecked inbox. And, and so 
with that being said, now you have these cases and you realize with true crime shows and so forth and social media, there's a lot of crime happening and a lot of similar types of crime happening. You, you would think that there's just a very small segment of, of the type of people who are doing it and, and they're all responsible for many crimes and it's not. There's, there's quite a few criminals out there, a very like-minded like -minded and following similar patterns. So this is where law enforcement does need help. So a detective is not going to be privy to all this database or, or all this uh, similar types of crimes do, uh, just like we are doing. Um, somebody's going to say, hey, did you look at Nashville? I, I didn't hear about Nashville. Um, and so thereby that detective can physically go into the system look at documents, try to identify what, where in Nashville and what is this crime about, could call up the Nashville PD or whatever surrounding jurisdiction and say, hey, I'm investigating a homicide. This is, I heard you have a similar homicide. Can you share data with me? And that, and that's the networking. And, and, and so um, tips may also be sending in, hey, have you looked at Nashville? And the detective can say, yep, I looked at Nashville and, and they have DNA. And the DNAs don't connect. So thereby, that's not similar to my crime. Or they don't have... Hey, Scott, DNA. Scott, Scott, real quick. Uh, it, the clock just ticked to 107 and STS Nation wanted a moment of silence. It's exactly seven months since uh, Hartford County Sheriff's uh, got the 911 call uh, that they found Rachel. So let's just take a few moments of silence and we'll get back to Scott. I got to tell you, as, as a dad, uh, the story is horrific as a parent. Um, Scott, didn't mean to cut you off there uh, for obvious reasons I did, but continue on with what you're saying. No, that, that was, thank you. And, um, and so in my moment of silence, I chose to say a prayer for Rachel, her family, and to find this killer. So with regards to all that, I, I, um, I think it is, it, it just goes to show a detective is doing everything they know how to do. Their networking uh, helps them determine the things they're not doing and should be doing. And the tips coming in also help to make, bring light to them of crimes they're not aware of where DNA has not automatically canceled each other out or send a signal to Harford to say, hey, we got your match and he's in custody or... He's not in custody, but get up with these detectives so you can share information. Uh, Matt, I know this is a tough one from a friend of the show, Tennis Girl 101, because you don't want to rub someone the wrong way that's trying to help. But are you satisfied uh, at this point with the uh, communication between uh, the family and Harford County uh, Sheriff's, uh, the office there? Are they being as transparent as they can, do you think? Uh, I think they're being surprisingly uh, transparent. Um, they tend to be extremely responsive, uh, usually uh, getting back uh, within minutes, if not, you know, you know, later that same day. And uh, they tend to to answer uh, very specific questions that are asked, uh, you know, minus a few obvious areas. They don't release any details about the specifics of the crime scene information that only the suspect uh, should know. Um, but they're extremely transparent. Um, I was just talking with them uh, yesterday, and you know that's also when I was told uh, that they did, in fact, do what what Scott was saying. Scott's on point as usual. Uh, they did uh, go ahead and reach out to the Nashville uh, law en law enforcement team and, and determine that the the cases are not linked. Uh, I understand that you know CODIS is is at play and it's gonna you know check automatically, but they reached out anyway just to make sure and. It is that the one in Nashville? I'm sorry. I'm yes. sorry. Is that okay? Okay. And it's not linked. And Correct. Uh, Matt, I know, I, I think I reached out to you when the Lake and Riley story broke. Mm -hmm. um, did you guys have a moment where you're like, maybe this is the guy? Um, and then the photo came out. It didn't, there were some resemblances, but was there a moment of kind of false hope there? And was that difficult? 
Um, a little bit. Uh, most of the time when I hear about attacks uh, across the country, um, I usually just discount them because I don't see any similarities. Uh, um, but with the, the 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 one that you just mentioned, um, it did grab my attention in the beginning because the, it sounded like there were a lot of similarities. But uh, as I saw photos of the suspect, um, I began to to not feel as if that they were linked. But I was still uh, happy to hear from the sheriff's department that they had uh, they were on point uh, on top of it, and they they had reached out and uh, eliminated the suspect. Uh, but there was a moment. Um, it's not discouraging. Um, it's unfortunate. Uh, I, I think anything because it's showing that you know more people are continuing to be attacked in the same way. Uh, and I just wish there was more awareness going out there to help prevent people from getting attacked uh, along these trails. You know, not wearing earbuds, not running alone, uh, breaking a whistle, um, just being aware of your surroundings. Um, and there was a, just a young girl uh, attacked by the mother's boyfriend and murdered in Orlando, Madeline Soto. Uh, we're going to be looking at that case tomorrow at a special time, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Nightwood wants to know, uh, Matt, if there's still a GoFundMe uh, for the kids. Uh, is there still a GoFundMe link? Uh, I... <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, I prefer not to get into that area. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll circle back with you privately. And if there is, I'll put it out there. And I'll also, I'm going to retweet out the sketches uh, and put them on Instagram. At Twitter, it's at podcast STS, at podcast STS. And on Instagram, it's at surviving the survivor, at surviving the survivor. I'll put out the uh, sketches uh, later today. Uh, and then the, you can just share them on social media. People in Northern Canada and Scotland are asking what you can do. You never know. This guy could literally have a relative in Scotland and he could be there for all we know. You just do not know. Um, Baby doll, an older woman was approached and beaten on a trail in Houston a few days ago, right by a school. She said kids were even around riding their bikes. Uh, Detective Phil Ramos, um, Seven months in, you're working this case hypothetically. Are you keeping your antenna up for other cases around the country, Phil Ramos, that have a similar MO to the case you're trying to solve? Yeah, sure. Uh, of course. Um, that's one of the things you look at. But you also are, have the advantage of looking for specifics on the MO. But was, was there some specific details in Rachel's case that match a case over here or something like that. And, and you can quickly uh, either include them for a more follow-up investigation or, or eliminate them as, as being not related. Um, you know, it's pretty generic uh, profile to say, well, a woman was jogging and she was attacked. Um, but so many things happened during that attack, where it happened, uh, what did the person look like? What, what kind of injuries did she suffer? God forbid it, if she uh, met her end like Rachel did, there are specific things to look at to compare other cases um, because not, obviously not every case is going to be uh, something that you need to do more follow up on. Only if there are similarities beyond what the public knows that's germane to the case that only the investigators know. Um, specific little things that they're not going to let out. And if those exist in another case, then absolutely you're following up on that quite a bit. Uh, Scott, I think this one's tough, but Abby, as you know, is uh, in love with Phil, your, your partner on Fridays. Is there a way for law enforcement to do a reverse internet search to flesh out anyone such as the perp who may have searched the case numerous times? I mean, that seems like a difficult task with, 380 million Americans, but your, your thoughts on that are, are there tricks? Yeah, there are tricks. So, and it is much more difficult. I, and, and I'll also say this being out retired, um, the technology is, is just, and the cyber technology has just changed in a, in a good way. Um, so anything could be outdated. I will say that 
I I have done certain checks like that. Um, not so much me, but it does require some some court documents, search warrants, subpoenas, etc. And um, and then when you realize you're going to be getting a lot of data, may, maybe maybe somewhere down the road, further down the road, when nothing is coming in. And, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're limited only by the, your, your imagination. And so, uh, kudos for that, for that thought. And I can guarantee you law enforcement has tried it, but ultimately it requires search warrants, subpoenas going out to many different IP providers based upon information that comes in. And you, you know, when you're talking millions of data, um, it, it's not something that helps you, but uh, just takes you away from from active leads. So this, it's a good question. It's a good thought. It has been done, um, and I'm sure there are ways to tweak it that are happening where it's not so encumbersome, but but it is. Uh, it's it's volume voluminous. It's 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 a big task. Mm. Uh, Annie K always has great questions. Um, Matt, I don't know if you can answer this one, but is there any way for volunteers or if people want to volunteer, uh, number one, where can they reach out? Number two, she's specifically asking to help look at CCTV or help in other ways that take too much time for law enforcement. Um, is there additional help that you could use, uh, for members of STS nation? Uh, I would think the other two guests would be able to weigh in more if, if law enforcement would be willing to have volunteers look at that my gut would be that they would not want uh private citizens looking through potential data uh, but i do know that uh the detectives do read every single email that go goes into the the rm tips uh, email line so you can send something through to them and uh they will see it they may not respond i do know that they do respond to a lot of those emails um but i i would think that they would not have you know regular yeah. you know, members of the community looking through potential data. Uh, Phil Ramos, did you ever use volunteers except maybe to um, go on a search for a body, but would you ever use it at any other times, Phil? No, not really. Um, <clears throat> only because uh, in general, the training isn't there and for them to know what, what they're looking for, like, like law enforcement knows what to look for on videotapes or surveillances or anything like that so when you have a great deal of manpower to do a search that's where volunteers come in but you know, when, when you get down to the nitty-gritty looking at evidence um, it, it would not be beneficial and sometimes detrimental to have non-trained people looking at what trained officers should be looking at mm. uh kelly p says his face needs to be on billboards um, there's been a few people asking about phenotyping, which I'm not sure about. Um, Scott Duffy, are you familiar with phenotyping and what it is and what it's being used for, if at all? No, uh, I'm not. I And I did see that comment. I I know enough, and it was actually at um, CronCon, Joel, the booth across from us. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, where I went over there just, just trying to learn what was happening. And, of course, Nick Mick um and and the sculpture of being able to take data from dna etc and being able to to do a a sculpture of a skull to put a face to an unknown right um so watching that work and and not knowing of those capabilities with the exception of of learning that just a couple of months ago so i i know mm -hmm. I support, I do, I know that they are doing that, but I don't know enough about how it's done. Yeah, and uh, that's an excellent point because you were with me at Crime Con and I remember they were putting together over the course of three days, this amazing three-dimensional sculpture, Karen Bushnell uh, telling Paul Schoenbaum who put, who put up uh, the uh, name of the lab, uh, that Parabon does DNA phenotyping to use an individual's DNA to get highly likely physical attributes. Matt McMahon, do you know if this is something that the uh, Hartford County Sheriff's Office has considered doing to create a three-dimensional sculpture, or is it something that you could uh, recommend to them maybe, or would want to recommend to them? I'm not aware of that. Um, 
I found that the sheriff's uh, department um, is responsive uh, when I'm asking direct questions. Sometimes they volunteer information, but usually when I ask them a direct educated question, which you know, Scott Duffy has been fabulous in helping me formulate questions in the past, um, that's when they give me really good uh, responses. And I've never asked that question. And I have not heard uh, about that technology from them, but after the show, I'll definitely reach out and ask them. Mm. Uh, this I is, uh, that, yeah, go ahead. I Matt. was going to say, I, I do know that they, they really do spare no expense, uh, when it comes to searching for Rachel's killer, uh, everything that you can think that they could possibly do. It sounds like they're doing, um, and they are, and it's not just the Harford County Sheriff's department. I know earlier, uh, somebody had uh, made a comment or asked a question, you know, to the point, uh, do they have the resources? It's not just the, the Harford County Sheriff's Department, it's not just LA. There's multiple agencies that are involved in working together as a team to try to find this guy. Uh, and because of that solid team that they have together, I, I am convinced with what Scott and, and is saying that they're going to find this guy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just hopefully before he does this again. Yeah, hopefully. So, so um, let me jump in on the on the yeah. phenotyping on that. Uh, Parabon, great organization. They've done this exact thing for us on a couple of cases here in Vegas, and and we have uh, their renderings based on the genotyping. And uh, the issue there becomes: Do they have enough of a full profile DNA profile to be able to extract that information so that they can start building the physical characteristics? Um, you need quite a bit quite quite a detailed full dna profile to do that and uh parabon's the best at it uh, the the detectives would know about that and and they would have already made that inquiry of parabon if the dna sample they have would qualify for that uh, genotyping yeah and by the way it's uh it's like the bust of the person so it's basically from yeah. the you know the well from the neck up but I will not be surprised, and I don't think Scott Duffy will either, that in five years from now, when uh, criminals caught with their DNA, they'll put a whole body together three-dimensionally and be able to even put it out over the internet where you can spin it around and, and look at them. We're definitely getting to that point, I think. Um, mm -hmm. This is going to make uh, an old-timer like Phil Ramos shake his head here, but it happens, and Tia Dash wants to know, what can internet sleuths, and there's plenty of them out there, Phil Ramos, what they what can they do to help without hindering information and the investigation? If there's someone who's a technical wizard on the computer, like me, I'm joking. I can't even turn a computer on, and they want to search for stuff. Uh, what would be um, practical or beneficial or nothing at all? What do you think? Well, based on what you have, you could uh, search crime reporting data bases from the LA area where the video is from. You can do a crime reporting databases where Rachel was found um, and and just piece by piece, if, you, if they have the time, check the details of every reported crime. Just about every jurisdiction now has crime maps so that if you're looking at a, for example, if you wanna buy a house in a certain area, what types of crimes are occurring within this area that you want. So there's a lot of information made available to the public for crime reporting statistics. And that would be one way to do it um, because the volume of those crimes being reported are just off the charts. There's so many crimes being reported. And if one has the interest in doing that, you can sit down at a crime map and, and look at every single crime that's on that map because it'll pop up the, the general details and something might jump out at someone and say, hey, wait a minute, look at look at this attempted burglary here. Some guy tried to break in and uh, it looks like the guy that was on the video in, in California. Um, does Matt McMahon think there's any chance Rachel could have, for whatever reason, gone there to meet someone and it went bad? Uh, Matt, I assume that you have uh, reflected on this a million times in your head. Is that one option that has crossed your mind? Um, at the very beginning, uh, I thought it was a possibility, but, uh, with all of the, with there's public information and there's private information. Uh, one of the pieces of information that is, is public is that somebody who personally knew Rachel, uh, 
was at the trailhead. Uh, it was a couple uh, spoke with Rachel briefly as she was beginning her run and she wasn't with anybody and nobody was following her. Uh, so based upon that and other unreleased information, she absolutely was not going there to meet anybody. Uh, she wasn't on the trail with anybody. She, she was ambushed on the trail. Um, and so far there's been no established link between Rachel and the suspect who did this. Uh, so there's a 0% chance of that. Uh, unequivocal, uh, Matt McMahon, yes. we know so little about Rachel. I mean, obviously you as uh family and, uh, father of her child do, but what, what would Rachel think of, um, you know, this search for her killer, Tell us a little bit about her, um, her personality, um, would she say, go out and get this guy, whatever you have to do. I mean, what, what, what kind of person was she? That's kind of, well, it's tough thinking what somebody else would respond to their own murder because it's tough for, for me to just deal with it myself and just to put myself in somebody else's shoes. But I, I think that the take that she would, she would have on this is that you need to do everything possible to catch this guy not only so he doesn't do it to other people but for her children because she would understand how much this is hurting her children um and she was very much focused on her children would do anything to her for her children to protect her children and catching this guy is a form of protecting her children because of how much it hurts that this guy is still out there and, and just unknown um rachel uh, as a person she had a lot of challenges uh in her life uh to the point to where it it totally amazes me of how she was able to be such a positive motivated uh person to you know start her own business to go out there and interact so positively with everybody in the town um and to stay in shape and just do everything that she can to have a, a positive uh, life and to create a better life for her children. There are so many times where I would go to the trail either for just for a walk or for canvassing efforts that we had uh, uh, used the trailhead as a beating point for where I would just run into countless people that everybody would say that, oh, yeah, I would run into Rachel all the time on the trail or I would run into her at the store. She was always so bright and she was friendly. Um, and it just amazes me that somebody like Rachel could be so positive and outgoing to everybody with all the challenges that she had to overcome in life. Um, yeah, and every, uh, that's beautifully said, every photo you see of her, um, you know, she's smiling, she looks, you know, bubbly and outgoing, uh, but this just goes to show, um, Phil Ramos that it's not, um, it's not just, the victim but it's the victims because it's not just the, mm -hmm. the woman who was murdered but now it's all the family members um i know i spoke to rachel's mom patty who's a sweet woman having a very difficult time she wanted to come on the show told me she just wasn't able to maybe down the road she will but uh phil this is a real ripple effect if you want to speak to that and also this comes up uh every time we do this story baby doll says I'm in my 40s and the amount of young baby girls running with both earbuds in y'all, please stay safe. Pepper spray. In hand. What do you tell uh, Phil? I can't remember if you have daughters or just sons, but I know you have grandchildren because you were in a pink room the other day. But um, <laughs> what's your advice? Um, first off, just about the ripple effect of victims and then your advice to young women, especially who are going to go out and jog today, uh, whether it's during the day or at night with those headphones in. Yeah, um, as far as the ripple effect goes, that's what drives us to keep going and going and going because we work for the surviving family members. We see the pain in, in their eyes and, and we see the children suffering and we see the family members going through unspeakable grief. And that's what keeps us going is, is our promise to them that we're, we're going to do everything we can to get you some closure and, and to hold the person responsible for this tragedy. We're going to do everything we can to do that. That that's a driving force behind every homicide detective I've ever worked with. Um, because very well known guy named Vern Gebberth, he was the commander of a homicide squad in New York. One of his sayings was we work for God, 
and we work for the real, met, the, the true victims of homicide, and that's the surviving family members. Because in the end, they're the ones that are suffering the most. Um, and, and that's that's where your focus has to be. Um, the minute you start thinking, oh, I'm never going to get this solved, let's put this case on the shelf, and then you talk to a little kid who's, whose mommy died, or you talk to a husband whose pregnant wife died, you put that case right back in front of you, and you just start reading it over and over again. So as far as the jogging, you know, you, you get to the point where how much of your freedoms and liberties do you want to give up? Do you want to stop living your life um, because of fear of things like this happening? But at the same token, do you want to get to the point where you're being careless? So you have to find that fine balance. You have to be able to continue working out, continue jogging, continue riding your bike through the, uh, the forest, but be aware of your surroundings. Situational awareness is something that we always tell people to really be keen on. And some people will carry, you, know, you, you hear so many tips, get your keys in between your fingers so you can scratch somebody, get some pepper spray. Personally, when my granddaughters are big enough to do that, I'm going to buy them a little taser so that they can have that with them because those tasers hurt like hell, man. And and that's mm. the, one of the best and quickest ways to uh, get somebody off of you is with a taser. But you have to find what's comfortable for you to keep living the life that you want without being so afraid to go out in public because of tragedies like this. It's a balancing act. Uh, shout out to Nightwood for gifting some memberships. Uh, f a few more things I just want to get through, and then we will uh, start to wrap. And just a reminder, at uh, 40 after, in just about eight minutes, uh, Dr. Richard Schuster, a very popular podcast host and a psychologist, he's going to pop in uh, just to let us know what he's up to. He's got a, a seminar coming up about parenting. He works very closely with Dr. G, uh, who's a very good friend of mine, and uh as we say, a rising tide lifts all ships here. That's what Steve Cohen says. So uh, I'm going to take a few minutes with Richard Schuster at the very end of the show in just about uh, now seven minutes. Um, you keep seeing the Rachel Moore in orange, uh, favorite color. Um, Scott Duffy, one of the things that uh, is interesting and bothersome is that in the state of Maryland, it is illegal to use investigative genetic genealogy in police investigations. Does this need to change and change quickly, um, or is that just wishful thinking? Because now we're getting into uh, privacy issues and things of that nature. Yeah, there are problems, and and I know different states have different levels of um, how how they describe privacy for the DNA and how the DNA was obtained. For you know, um, so yeah, I do believe there should be some uniform legislation that comes out to kind of squash anything that that still has that balance and respect for privacy while at the same time not hindering great um uh avenues into solving crime i'm not really aware of what the specifics are for for maryland and them not allowing so so for example outside the dna arena if, if a state has a specific law, sometimes the feds could get involved to kind of circumvent that. Um, so I'm not sure what what aspects of the law there are in Maryland. I, I would like to know more about that. But but so, for example, like um, two two part two two party consent in some states, it's it's hey, both parties got to consent to a recording. And um, and so then the feds have a one party consent and that party would be either the law enforcement or that working on behalf of. And, um, so I'm, I'm, it'd be interesting to see what, what avenues they're taking because, uh, um, to either try to advance the investigation with these laws in place against genealogy, but I'm not really sure what, what specifically prevents Maryland and specific Harford County from, utilizing you know i'm it, it it it'd be interesting to know exactly what that law is 
Uh, LFT decipher Maryland. Uh, she's breaking this down for us a little bit. Maryland has more laws surrounding the use of it, of IgG and how and when it can be used in investigation. So maybe it can be used, but just in, um, you know, more strict circumstances. Uh, Phil Ramos, this is uh, in your wheelhouse here. Can law enforcement uh, check jails? Who took DNA since Rachel's murder? Do they enter the new DNA into CODIS right away, or is it only after conviction? It depends on, on what their, again, the jurisdiction and the protocols for that jurisdiction and what a person is arrested for. Um, not everybody that goes into a jail has to submit to a uh, DNA swap, get, get your profile done. Here, if you're arrested for a violent crime, then we're, we're given that uh, allowance to do that but if you go in for shoplifting and and you get a citation then no but it like i said it depends on the jurisdiction um, once that dna profile is obtained it goes into codis and if there's a hit then all the red flags go up and uh, if it's a local hit uh, interstate hit national international hit that's a that's a huge advantage and, and i can tell you one thing man as, as an investigator it's so frustrating when you're handcuffed by politicians and say well we don't want this abused by the police and that's why we're not going to let you use uh, genetic genealogy to solve a crime and and i just want to scream and say well if it was your daughter that was murdered you can bet your ass that you'd want us to do that yeah, hundred percent, and I'm glad you said it. Um, Matt McMahon, uh, someone was asking, "What does this video have to do?" So this is video from Los Angeles of um, what they say was a home invasion and an assault, mm -hmm. and um, and this is that video. But Matt, uh, someone is asking. Uh, sorry to cover Scott's face there. Scott's like trying to look over the uh, comment. If you watch the video, Matt, someone mm -hmm. closes the door on him. Uh, do we know? Because at first we heard it was a young girl. Then someone said it's a young man. Um, yeah. Do we know whose arm that is, Matt? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Sheriff Gaylor uh, initially incorrectly said that it was the arm of a, a female. And then during a later interview, corrected himself. Um, the detectives always knew whose arm that was. He he just got confused and he owned up to that in an interview. Uh, so that is, in fact, uh, a male's hand. Um, so basically what had happened was this man had entered, the suspect had entered this home, not from the front door, another entrance. I don't know if it's a back door or a window. I just know he did not enter through that door, which is why there's not an earlier video. Um, he um, assaulted some young children uh, in the home and then uh, another uh, older sibling uh, came and fought him off and ushered him out the door. Uh, I know that some people feel like this is uh, uh, somebody just saying goodbye and that it's all cordial, but it absolutely was not cordial. And what was happening is exactly what I think a lot of people would do if they were in the same situation is they were trying to get this violent suspect away from the children that he was harming to protect them. Um, I've heard so many conspiracy theories about how they feel this family is protecting the suspect or is complicit in some way. But the reality is that the people that live in that house, they're victims, they were attacked. They're very lucky because we know what this man is capable of doing. And that didn't happen there. Um, and also the people in this house, they've been instrumental because if it was not for this family, we wouldn't have the DNA from the hat uh, that was turned over to the police when the police responded. We wouldn't have this video. Uh, and we wouldn't have the sketches. So we would really be nowhere with Rachel's case without the people in that house. Um, and that's that's an excellent point that they are helping. Um, I didn't know this, but Sarah Adams, I would love to know why he was comfortable to be barefoot here. What Do we know? Was he barefoot, Matt, at this time? Um, I believe if, if you do look at the, the video where he's walking all the way out, I do believe he's barefoot. And I've actually taken his demeanor leaving and how he's just casually strolling out um, as more of a sign of, of 
how demented he really, really kind of, I don't know if demented is the right word. I mean, he, he's cocky. He feels in control. He just had an altercation as being pushed out of the house after, you know, assaulting some children and getting into, you know, a fight mm -hmm. with somebody who's a little bit older and other people were waking up and he didn't seem concerned at all walking out the house. So I, to me, I feel like that's somebody who's mentally not the same type of person that you and I are, where you would get into his fight and you might be riled up. He didn't seem to care and he just strolled off. Um, I mean, he's a psychopath. He he acts not in a, in a way that we would expect. Uh, you could say that again. Uh, LFT says diabolical. Um, as promised, um, Dr. Richard Schuster is here. He is the voice behind the acclaimed Daily Helping podcast, Dr. Schuster. Uh, he is a figurehead in the psychology community. And in a moment, he's going to tell you what he's up to. But since we have a renowned psychologist, I know you're coming into this, not even midstream, but very tail end of the stream. We're here with uh, Matt McMahon and homicide uh, detective Phil Ramos and former FBI agent Scott Duffy. Um, Matt McMahon's oldest child, his only child, his daughter, was the oldest child of Rachel Morin, who was murdered uh, back in August, uh, Dr. Schuster. Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but uh, Matt is trying to stay as positive as possible. His family is having a very difficult time. Any words of wisdom from a therapist, a trained therapist in all this? I can tell you uh, that I have a lot of experience working in crisis response teams where uh, I was deployed after there were school shootings. And so the, the closest I can relate to this is having to deal with the families of a senseless tragedy. Uh, and all I can, can say is, um, you know, saying, you know, you, you have our sympathy obviously doesn't do it justice. Uh, what I would advise you to do is stick very close to the people who love you and support you let them be the rock for you and grieve because you know we, we need people around us during times like this to help us through it. Yeah. Uh, Richard Fay, uh, Matt's daughter and Rachel's oldest child. Uh, she, she really wouldn't leave the room. Matt was telling us until December, but Rachel was a big workout fanatic. And now uh, she to honor her mom is getting into fitness. I assume that has to be a positive advancement in her psychological state that she's able because i know myself when i'm really stressed out or bummed out uh it's one of the hardest things for me to do is get to the gym but um is this a, is this a positive sign that this young uh she's 18 right uh matt yes yes she's yes, 18 she's she'll eight, be uh, yes, 19 in july 19 in july uh what advice would you have to her that matt can pass on i mean i would say that if she's locked in in physical fitness right now, um, that's an extraordinary thing because the data is very clear that there are many health benefits, both psychologically and physiologically, to engaging in working out. People that are more active uh, tend to have you know, hormones released into their bloodstreams that are more positive in nature, endorphins. Um, your immune system gets higher. Uh, people who work out more tend to be able to mitigate depression and anxiety a little bit better than people who don't. So uh, that's a positive channel. Uh, and I would certainly encourage her to keep doing that. Uh, by the way, just uh, thanks to Dr. G, we had now have uh, Dr. Richard Schuster, who will now become a best guest because uh, he has no other choice. We'll get him <laughs> on to discuss uh, a bunch of these cases. And like I said, he has his own big podcast and he's going to tell us uh, what he's up to in just one moment. And uh, I'm going to have these guys stick around to listen to it. Cause I think it might be impactful for them as well. But Scott Duffy, Sarah Adams is on the, um, she's on it. She won't let go. She wants to know, <laughs> um, is his being barefoot not significant? In other words, isn't it significant? Is this something that means that maybe he was near his house in LA, how closely do you have to look at these bare feet, Scott Duffy? Yeah, it all it all depends on the circumstances, and so thereby, as as Matt's explaining things that I I didn't even uh, know, to with regards to the demeanor and and so forth, a an assault just took place inside the house, and um, and so I I don't know his level of um. um clothing so was he um was he in the process of getting dressed and 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 then a 
family member rushes him out. He grabs his shoes. And so thereby he's now he's thinking, OK, I just want to get out um, as opposed to let me let me take my time. Let me put my shoes and socks on or sandals, whatever he, he might be carrying. And and then um, and then I'll be on my way. So it, it, it could mean something if he left on his own. But if if he's ushered out, um, it could just be just that where he's just grabbing whatever he can gra grab, forgets his hat, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which is a good thing, but uh, did not want to forget his shoes. So mm -hmm. it depends. Um, so I want to get final thoughts, but um, Richard is here to just tell us he's going to be uh, running uh, an event called the Power of Stress Tolerance for Parents. Uh, this is something for all parents out there, perhaps even grandparents. Without further ado, Richard Schuster, a friend of Dr. G explains, one guy I really love, Dr. G. Um, what is the power of stress tolerance for parents? And if STS Nation, uh, 100,000 plus strong, wants to engage or get involved in this, what do they do? I appreciate that, Joel. Yeah, so Dr. G and I actually go back 17 years, which is really crazy. Uh, so... Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I host a podcast called The Daily Helping, and we're in about 150 plus countries. I've been doing this show for a little over seven years. And the goal uh, of the show is to get other people to commit acts of kindness because I know there's neurobiological things that happen when we do good things for other people. And I was really thinking about how I could have a big impact. I'm a parent. I have two kids. Um, and if you don't know me, you don't know my story. A couple of years ago, I suffered a stroke and I almost died and would have left my wife and children without a dad and provider. And the, the stroke was caused by stress. And that really made me kind of rethink my life and how it is that I do things. And so what I decided to do is I've been working on helping people have more balance in their lives. Uh, I wanted to put on an event. And so this is actually the, the first virtual event that I've done. And so I have corralled a, a friend of mine who's the CEO of a company called Newcom. And this guy is one of the most foreknown experts on stress management in the world. Uh, he trains the CIA. He works with professional sports teams. Like this guy knows everything there is to know about stress. And he's going to talk to parents in our event, teaching you strategies, how to really understand stress, how it impacts your brain, the body, and to help teach you how to talk to your kids about stress. And the really cool thing is we partnered with a charity down in Florida called Kindness Matters 365, and a portion of every ticket is going to support them and the great work they're doing in about 130 schools nationwide and around the world. So uh, if if STS Nation wants to get involved, you can go to drrichardschuster.com. Uh, spell it any way you want. I bought all the domains of Dr. Richard Schuster. <laughs> <laughs> click click on the link. There's a banner at the top. And if you use the code STS, you will get 10% off the price of admission. And the first five people who sign up for this will get free VIP access where we're doing a private Q&A with Jim Poole about stress management at the very end of this thing. But it's a it's a great it's a great cause. You're helping an amazing charity and you're going to learn a lot how to manage stress for you and your kids. And I hope to see all of you there. Uh, wonderful. And we've got it up there on the uh, screen right now. It is uh, Dr. Richard Schuster. For those listening, it's S-H-U-S-T-E-R, no C. Uh, the program, the event is the power of stress tolerance, and you can use code STS. And uh, charity is going to uh, Kindness360. Is that it, Richard? Kindness Matters 365, yeah. And we're all about kindness at STS Nation. Um, so please, if you're interested, uh, there is more information um what an amazing panel today i do want to get uh final thoughts and leave the final one for uh, matt mcmahon but dr phil ramos is a retired senior homicide detective uh love this guy 35 years of service 15 years in homicide the guy still rides his harley like a madman through the streets of vegas and he does it with a helmet three-time officer of the year he infiltrated the cuban mob and carried a million bucks of cash through a Vegas casino. Who who can say that? No one can say that except Detective Phil Ramos. The detective, um, are you as confident as Scott Duffy, 100% sure that they are going to eventually 
catch this guy and your final thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with uh, Scott hundred percent. They, that will happen. It's not going to happen, uh, fast enough for the family. And, um, you know, I'm sorry for that, but don't give up, man. Uh, Matt, don't give up. Tell the kids don't give up. It's going to happen. Um, you just got to be patient and, and it's the hardest thing in the world to do. It's easy for us to sit here and say, yeah, just, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But my experience, the tools that we have now, they're going to find him. They're going to find this guy. And and once they once they got a name to that face, he's done, man. He's got DNA at two crime scenes. You you know you eyewitnesses can give bad information, but you cannot doubt DNA. DNA is there. It's a slam dunk on this case with the DNA. And I cannot wait to do a show after he's caught. Uh, to out this guy and uh, finally mm -hmm. say that there is justice for Rachel Moore. And of course the uh, legal proceedings will have to uh, take place in order for that to be officially said, but you get the idea. Agent Scott Duffy, he is director of the w Wilmington university's criminal justice Institute, former FBI boss in Wilmington, Delaware prior to that five and a half years uh, as a Pennsylvania uh, officer in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, Scott Duffy, your final thoughts today uh, my heart is aching for uh matt and the whole family i know yours does and once again i don't think everyone knows this that scott duffy um on his own time uh gives advice and help to the Morn family as does doug mcgregor the geo profiler as does tim papa from the fbi so scott is a stand-up guy but scott your uh, your final thoughts yeah, my thoughts and prayers continue to go with Matt and his family. And uh, thank you, Joel, for having us on because I'm a big proponent, especially when you're bringing family members to tell the story. No secondhand information. It's right from right from the victim's mouth. And uh, Matt and his whole family, just like Phil had said, uh, law enforcement does it for the family members, right? And uh, so thanks for continuing to push this. Um, I'm 100 plus percent. It is no doubt he will be caught. And um, but we do hope it's in in a time where before somebody else gets hurt. So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, the reason uh, Scott and Phil are able to do their jobs, if it was me and I caught this guy, I'd smack him in the face. But you can't do that. You've got to be uh, civil in this country, even though I bet Scott and Phil have wanted to do that a few times. Um, but that's just me. Uh, Dr. Richard Schuster, he is the voice behind, if you haven't listened to it, check it out, the Daily Helping Podcast. What a good name, the Daily Helping Podcast. You heard he suffered a stroke, almost died, and left his family, now trying to uh, do some good. Um, psychologically speaking, Dr. Richard Schuster, uh, to the Morin family, uh, you know, there is a feeling of desperation sometimes when you're not getting answers and it feels like there's no end in sight. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. What What do you say to Matt and the rest of the family uh, if they are beginning to feel that way again? And I think those feelings undulate. They come and go. So what, what do you say about that? I would say, you know, again, to echo what the other gentlemen have said, that my thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. Um you know, hold strong to the people who love you the most, tune out a lot of the noise. I, I would tell you, honestly, don't, don't put on the news, <laughs> don't put on the TV and just focus on who is with you, who loves you and know that, that justice will be done and have faith that it will be done. Uh, as a former news guy, I, uh, second that sentiment. Don't watch the news. It's, it's horrible. Uh, Matt McMahon, um, his only daughter, Faye, is Rachel Morin's oldest child. Uh, Matt, um, I know you're suffering. I know you're going through a lot of pain. I know the family's having trouble. Uh, we are here for you. Uh, I know we're going to do a show soon that uh, celebrates the capture of uh, Rachel's killer, but I uh, just uh, want to leave the floor open to you for your final thoughts on this day. And also, please send your love to the family. Um. Well, you just put up on the screen uh, exactly what my final thoughts would be, is to keep sharing the information about Rachel. Um, it's because if we let Rachel be forgotten and stop 
sharing the information about the suspect, then we're never going to, well, the, they might still catch the suspect, but we're a lot more likely to catch him and catch him quicker if we keep sharing all of the information about the suspect. So please just keep sharing shows like this, the sketch, and keeping her name alive. Uh, I know her children, they, they, they definitely want the suspect to be caught, but they also don't want their mother to be forgotten. Um, I, I hear that a lot from Faye. Um, and, and that came from her when she was talking about, you know, the headstone uh, for her mother's that she was worried something would happen and that over time it would become covered, you know, maybe even just a hundred years down the road or something. So it's keeping Rachel out there and not letting people forget is also extremely important to her kids. Um, we will obviously continue to stay on it and uh, we will be back tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, with a show on Madeline Soto, a special time, 2 p.m. Eastern. And then Friday, Phil and Scott, I'm going to ask Scott if he can do two because I have to record on Friday, and hopefully he says yes. But I didn't have that conversation, but I just threw him under the bus telling him that that's the time, and hopefully it will work. But until then, love you, America. Love you, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Georgia, Las Vegas, of course, Bel Air, Maryland. And uh, guest stick around for one second. Justice for Rachel Morin. Don't forget about her. Tweet, retweet, get it out on social. I'm at Podcast STS, at Surviving the Survivor on Instagram. I'm going to put up these sketches. Please help circulate them. See you tomorrow.